most of you survived this morning and came back tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I want to continue on in 2 Timothy, kind of where we left off earlier today. <laughs> Through the years, there's been things God has spoken to me, and usually they came in a totally unexpected time. He would just speak something. One of the times I was sitting in Dublin, Ireland, waiting to minister on a Sunday morning. Before, as normal, I seek God the evening before, Lord, why do you want to minister tomorrow? And He said, I'll let you know later. The next morning, I seek Him later. Now we're going to church. Later. <laughs> now they're leading the worship and praise. And I said, Lord, if you want to speak to you speak later. <laughs> now the pastor's introducing me. <laughs> and while he's introducing me, then all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord came on me. Wow. And the Lord said, never in the history of the church has so many people been given so much and done so little with it. Now, Brother H. Scott, would you please come and minister? <laughs> and I minister for an hour and a half, and that's such a praise God. <clears throat> when I got back home, that just stuck in my mind. And I said, Father, just how much are we actually missing? It? And this is the example he gave me. He said, if you would take the least person in the eyes of man in my kingdom, that person has the potential now to be used to me in a greater way than the greatest ones are being used now. Let me say that again. He said, if you take those that everyone would agree is the least one in my kingdom now, they have the potential now to be used to me in a greater way than the greatest ones are being used now. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I don't think we realize what potential you have. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It has nothing to do with our abilities. It has to do with our availability. He doesn't need our abilities. He's got the ability. He needs our availability. He wants to manifest himself through us. I thought, when I said, God, why do you waste your time with that? It'd be so much easier if you just went ahead and did it yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's hard getting through it. He said, son, everybody knows I can do it. What glory would that bring to me? Ah, oh, but if I can do it through you. That's <laughs> a <laughs> So, and I explain why he's chosen the foolish to confound the wise. So that brings more glory to him. There's nobody going to be touching his glory on that. Because everybody knows he can't do it. <laughs> so if it gets done, then it has to be God. So God has also chosen those foolish to confound the wise. So God is amazing. And it's exciting that that lies within every one of us. Everything you have, everything you'll ever need to walk in the fullness of your heritage is already in you. It's already been paid for. It's already done. It's a done work. All you got to do is meet the conditions for that to manifest through you. <coughs> Basically so that when God does manifest through you, that you don't touch his glory. You give him the glory. He'll honor you and he'll bless you. I remember when God first started training me in the ministry. Once I understood that God could read my thoughts and I never get anything. If I'm thinking that I might as well say it, otherwise I'm just adding hypocrisy to it. And I got two things to repent of. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kept it simple. So I realized God had called me in the ministry. And I said, okay, Lord, I love you. You know I never wanted to be a minister, so this wasn't my idea. So I'm doing this because I love you. But I said, I read your word. <clears throat> And you seem to be a little bit touchy about your glory. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to be stupid and actually touch it, go up smoke, but you know, just because I'm ignorant. And so God and I had an agreement right off the beginning because I would ask him to take truth 
that even though they might be clear, it wasn't all that clear to me. God didn't claim to be a rocket scientist, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so many people misinterpret what he's saying. So I would ask him to put in just simple language so there's no mistaking what it meant for me. So about everything I do, I've had him give me those kind of definitions. So there wasn't no wiggle room, you understand know, so what I'm saying? This is it. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, I said, what, are, what does it mean that all glory is due to you? He said, it means all credit is due me. I says, okay. I don't mind. You can have all the credit. This is what I was thinking, so I said it. I said, but Father, it don't seem fair if I'm going to do half the work, but you can get all the credit. <laughs> he didn't hit me either. <laughs> I didn't want <whoop> smoke. <laughs> he said, no, son, that wouldn't be fair. I said, but God, but you said you wanted all the credit, all the glory. He said, that's right. I said, but God, if you're going to get all the credit, it looks to me like you should do all the work. He said, that's right, son. I never asked you to do the work to start with. <laughs> I asked you to allow me to do the work through you. And whatever I do through you, you give me the credit for what I did. Anything you did, you can have credit for that, because that's all it's worth. It has no return of value. <laughs> But if you allow me to do my work through you and give me credit for what I did, I will make you a vessel of honor in my house and I will bless you. But I will not give credit to you for what I did. Amen. I said, now, well, make, make, let me make sure I've got this straight now. You want me to work for you, but you don't want me to do the work. And if I won't do the work and let you do it and give you the credit for it, you want to bless me and honor me? You got it. <laughs> oh, that's the best job I've ever had. <laughs> Do you have any idea how hard that was? Because <laughs> everything in me wanted to do something. Mm -hmm. The man who shared the story about true and truth that I shared her years ago, he had this thing. If you help God a lot, he can do a little. But if you only help him a little, he can do a lot. Mm -hmm. Ah, if you just get when you don't help him at all, he can do anything. Just let go and let God. That's mm -hmm. it. And that's where I come from, and that wasn't easy. So I had to be empty to self, all my ambitions, all my opinions, all my theories. And I had to get rid of all the, hump, the hindrances and things to where I would have a tendency to add to or take away from something he's saying. So he could manifest freely when I don't even know how he's going to manifest without me being nervous about it. And let him say whatever he wants to say through me in whatever tone he wants to say it in. Whether it's an exhort, a reproof, or rebuke. And not be nervous about it. That was the hard training. With that being able to just completely let go and let God. Now, yes, I need to get to know him. That was part of it. So I understand how he's functioning. Just like Shirley knows me. So if something happened, she could almost guarantee she could tell you how I will react in that situation. Because she's seen me in those kind of situations many times. <clears throat> so when I see God in all these different ways, I know generally how he's going to react. So it's no big surprise to me if he starts to manifest that way. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the training was getting to know him, getting to understand who he is, getting to understand his principles and his truths so that I know they're him when it is manifesting. Mm -hmm. That I'm not ignorant of the enemy's ways. So when he's manifesting and realize that and God manifests to deal with that, I understand what's going on. I'm just watching it. You know, the exciting thing about this is to let you be on the front row to watch God work. That's pretty cool, you know? That's cool. And especially when I go to places to where I'm hopelessly lost without Him. I'm telling you what, I'm just going to be a, a casualty number if He doesn't show up. So to see Him not only deliver me in a situation, but then watch how He gets me out, that's what's fun. I was a little nervous in the beginning. I'd always said, well, it's going to be kind of interesting to see how you get out of this one, because it wasn't my idea to get there start with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to help you. I was going to make sure I didn't help you, because then I'm losing part of the rewards, huh? Right. Back and and the first time I ever said that, the Lord said, son, is anything too hard for me? Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I just chuckled, and it wasn't a chuckling time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I said, the Lord, no, there's not anything too hard for you. He said, then you stand back and see the salvation of the Lord your God, and then you saw the reboot. 
So that's pretty much the simplicity in that relationship with God in walking and what our potentials are. He is no respecter of person. There is no second class citizens in his kingdom. We're all special individually. He's called us for purpose. He decided who we were before we was even born. He knows exactly where he wants you to function in the body of Christ. He knows exactly what he's preparing you to do in his kingdom throughout eternity. And he's authorized the Holy Spirit living in us to teach us everything we know and equip us to prepare us for that. And if we don't reach that, it's because we allow the thief to rob the promise of our heritage. Just simple as that. And the bottom line, when we stand before God, we are all <coughs> give an account for what we allow the enemy to steal of our heritage. We can't blame it on the preacher or wife or husband, mom and daddy or anybody else. It's us. We had the protector in us, we had the wisdom in us, we had the power in us, we had everything we need to be victorious. And we had an instruction book. And very simple instruction. It wasn't complicated. He set his kingdom up, that he said, except you come as a little child, you shall no wise enter into his kingdom. You didn't have to wait till you was a grown up or in first grade or second grade. As a child, you're capable of coming into his kingdom. As a matter of fact, the day we were born into the family, we were translated into the kingdom. We hadn't been able to do anything. And that was our heritage. And we should have grown up there, but we didn't. <coughs> Many times we've hired the ministers to do the study for us. We want them to go off and get an education and come to study us. And the trouble is it becomes the blind leading the blind in many cases around the world. You hold the responsibility for yourself. In 2 Timothy 2, 4, 15, it says, Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's our responsibility. To study and show ourselves approved. A workman that does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Most don't do that. We don't rightly divide the word of truth. We read the word of truth with a corrupted system of reasoning and understanding. That allows the enemy to bring us ways that seems right and deceive us. Rather than learning how to communicate with the teacher that is within us that can lead us into all truth and teach us all things. Yes, those who fail to teach us that should have, those who've led us astray and taught us ways that seems right, they will have the greater punishment, but it does not excuse us. If you never, ever was in a church, ever had a pastor, if you didn't ever even have a Bible, there is no reason for you not to become exactly who you're supposed to be in Christ. Because if you're a real Christian, the Spirit of God is in you, and He doesn't need any help to get the job done. He needs your availability, He doesn't need your ability. He just needs your availability. And I assure you, anybody, I don't care if they got saved in the boondock somewhere, and nobody else around with them, if they humble themselves before the Most High God, and yield themselves to Him, the Holy Spirit will teach them. And He will prepare them for whatever they're supposed to be. And I guarantee they will be a vessel of honor in this kingdom when He shows up. It has nothing to do with how great a work God did through you here. It has to do with whether the work that you've been doing, He actually did through you. And whether or not that's what He calls you to do. And if you were faithful and just in that. And trustworthy. Simple. How many of you want to hear when you stand before God as the pastor said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant? Yeah. Okay. Are we going to wait till we get there before we find out if that's what you're going to hear? Because that's pretty much a gamble. Mm -hmm. As much as I minister, some people are tickled to hear me and some aren't too tickled. Mm -hmm. Depends on where I'm going. Because I'm sent for those with the heart after God, especially in the early years. When he opened the door from every denomination you can imagine around the world, there might be three people who prayed me in, and God sovereignly opened the door, and later the pastor wished he had not invited me, but God sovereignly got me in the pulpit. 
Then you got 97 of them that wished I'd have stayed in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> and they're making sure you understand. So I got 97 people firing at me and three drawing. And I can't minister what God wants to them through them if my spirit's closed and I'm pulling out the sword trying to chop and keep them off. So I've got to be able to stand there with my heart open, my spirit open, with them firing darts at me for an hour to reach those three. Mm -hmm. I've done that for years. Mm -hmm. It doesn't offend me. I don't close up my spirit and I don't start firing by it. That's part of my training. I had to be able to endure that as a soldier. Mm -hmm. But I assure you, I not only could endure it, before I leave the building, there's no room whatsoever. And I go right out to the next meeting four hours later and do the same thing again. If I couldn't do that, I shouldn't have been there. Well, God loves those people. But many times because I went to those three and my heart was open and I did not shoot back. Many times the first time I would share testimony and come into the real deep breaking time I went through, usually about a half an hour into the message. But usually when I got to that point and they realized this is real of what I'm talking about, most of them would quit shooting. Then in a few minutes when they kind of hear where it went from there, then most of those would start growing for the last 20, 30 minutes. So it wasn't just the three that came there. Several others opened their heart. But they weren't open at all. But those three got the door and gave the other ones an opportunity. So that is our preparation that we have to do. We have to be ready for God to use us wherever we are. We've got to have faith in God that he doesn't need help to get done what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's not desperately trying to find somebody to go do his work. There's a purpose part. We are preparing for <coughs> eternity. When I go out and minister like I am here, sometimes I go and everybody may be very free and like yours and say, oh, that's a great message, brother, whatever. Somebody may not like it. Whatever. You understand what I'm saying? I had one woman in one church in England she come up and I don't know if she got a bead in her bonnet or what, but she wasn't very happy. And she comes, she says, I want you to know I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> I, I said, well, thank you. I said, I need the prayer you need to practice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so we're supposed to be studying to show ourselves approved unto God. When I minister, regardless of whether there's a happy response or a negative response, that is not the measure of whether I was successful in this pulpit tonight. Mm -hmm. When I go home before I go to sleep tonight, then I ask the Father, were you able to speak to me what you want to speak to your children? And I had him grade me. Mm -hmm. Was it okay, fair, or were you pleased, or were you well pleased? I had him grade me. Yeah. So if he's well pleased with what I've done here, and I'm hearing that every day, then I will hear it well pleased when I stand before him in heaven. Mm -hmm. It's important to know. It's important not to assume. That's why the communication is important to ask. Because mm -hmm. if I'm missing the mark, I need to change attitude right now. I need to understand so I can change my aim and start hitting the mark. Mm -hmm. Not wait then and hoping I was hitting the mark. Mm -hmm. We need to examine ourselves. Mm -hmm. We need to regularly examine ourselves to make sure we're in the faith and we're walking where God wants us to walk. Not just call her pastor or somebody that says, you're okay, we're okay. Or you're a good person, you're okay. There's a whole lot of good persons in the world that's going to go to heaven. Right. Yeah. Understand? They're trying to find some other way except what Jesus provided, and there is no other way. In the 24th verse in chapter 2, it was saying, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance through the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now here we have a group of people <coughs> that Satan can take captive at his will. Think about that. One of the reasons you would not ordain a novice into the ministry is because of his immaturity and Satan can take him captive whenever he wants to. Nobody wants to be taken captive. The problem is many people have been taken captive and they don't even know they're captive. 
We don't even know we're in a snare until we start trying to get out of that snare. So that's how subtle and cunning and crafty Satan is. When I was talking about ways it seems right, when I was talking about Satan coming as an angel of light earlier, and his ministers was Christian teachers and pastors, and they're sharing things that seems right to your mind. If you're listening from the natural reason, understand they can share things that are absolutely true, scripture with no false things in it, but bring you to a conclusion because they left out other key scriptures, and the conclusion is a lie. As soon as you believe that lie, if you did not bring the thoughts under control like God told you to do, and test it by the Holy Spirit, is it the truth or not, before you release your faith into it, then you just fell into a snare. As soon as you took that bait, as soon as you released your faith into it, boom, you were taken in a snare. And from that point on, whatever the real truth was, you're no longer even looking for it. He has stolen that truth from you. He's trapped you so you can no longer get to that truth. You're not looking for it anymore. If anybody shares with you about something, the walls will up, you won't listen to them. You won't hear it from anybody else, but everybody around you probably believes the same thing if it's a denominational doctrinal thing. It's not easy to get out of that. So how do we, real brothers and sisters, if you understand these ministers, these teachers and pastors, are Christian teachers and pastors. That means they're our brothers or sisters. So how do we help rescue them? Have you ever seen that? You go to some other denomination that's believing something you know is a lie. And you go to it and you tell them what you know is true and see how happy they are to find that out. <laughs> I mean, save time, just go to the pastor because if you can change him, then he can change the rest of the congregation and save you some time. That would really go over good, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know it does not going to work. So it's not easy to get out. The problem is, most everybody are in some of those snares. If you're not walking in the fullness of who you're supposed to be, if you don't have close fellowship with God, if you're not maturing spiritually and have communion with God, then you are in snares. That's the reason you are not there. You said, well, I didn't know this. I was ignorant of this. Then that's because you was in a snare. That's why you're ignorant of it. There's some snare. So Satan brought something you believe that wasn't necessary to look that way. So it was okay, so you kept going another way. So everybody has got snares from time to time that we've got to deal with. When we read the Bible, those of you at least are hungry, you read the Bible, and if you ever read the Bible and got convicted of something that was wrong, that maybe you didn't even realize was wrong before, and you all of a sudden the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, and you say, wow, I didn't realize I was missing that. Well, if you didn't realize you was missing, you thought what you were doing was okay, you were in a snare. But when you had ears to hear the truth, then you had an opportunity to rescue yourself and get yourself out of the snare. Now, this is important. We cannot rescue anyone from those snares. If I could do that, I'd be tearing up snares all over the countryside. Because I'd have no problem whatsoever to go and run the devil off from over his part. I have no problem getting him out of the scene. But I cannot take you out of the snare. I didn't put you in the snare. You put yourself in the snare. You're the one that took the bait. How do you get into one of these snares? If it's taking you away from the truth, now I'm not talking about the open rebellious people. I'm talking about serious Christians that's trying to walk with God, but they're not hitting the mark. Satan had to bring the bait in the form of usually your pastor or a leader sharing something that made sense to your natural mind because you never taught how to test something in the spirit and you released your faith into it and believed it and you immediately went into that snare. The problem is you don't hear anything different so you stay in the snare. But what if all of a sudden somebody like myself or Keith comes along and I do a teaching and I share some scriptures around that particular subject and you realize what you have been believing weren't the truth. You're sitting there and the Holy Spirit is witnessing to what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is exposing something that you were believing was a lie, was the truth, but you now realize it's a lie. So you're in a spot. Well, I believe this is the truth, 
But I believe what Joseph was saying too. He gave scriptures and that sounded right. Because you could be listening to me with your mind as well. But what I'm saying may be convincing to you. And you say, okay, I'm going to release my faith. Believe what Joseph said. But when you try to release your faith, you'll get this pop up on your screen. Yeah, but I also believe this. Wait a minute, that's contrary to what Joseph said. And now the confusion starts setting in. And you think, well, which one is the truth? Well, if I'm at your church one night, and everybody else in your church believes what you've been believing, even if what I was saying was the truth, which one are you going to believe? Are you going to quit believing what you believed and everybody in your denomination believes and start believing what Joseph taught that one night? Or are you going to go back to what everybody else believes? You'll go back to what everybody else believes. It's not easy to get out of that. So how should we approach these people that we know are in error? We know they're believing God, but they believe they're believing the truth. First of all, the name of our ministry is called Servants of the Lord Ministry. And I didn't know the scripture when God named our ministry, okay? But it said, the servant of the Lord, so especially speaks to our ministry, <laughs> we must not strive. So if somebody doesn't agree, you're not agreeing on a doctrinal thing with somebody, we're not supposed to be debating and striving with someone trying to prove our point to them, and they're trying to prove their point. We're not supposed to do that. But we're supposed to be gentle unto everyone. Not fired up, but gentle to them and be able to teach. Not just throw out some opinion, but actually give a foundation of what it is that you're believing and be patient so that you're instructing them in righteousness, but you're instructing those that are actually opposing themselves. Isn't that an interesting statement? He said you should be teaching meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Once Satan has gotten us to believe a lie, he does not have to waste any more time with us. He can go on down the road. He doesn't have to stay there and defend that lie. You will defend it. Because you're convinced it's the truth. And he'd go about his business. He had the pastor defending it. You understand? The whole denomination will defend it. He doesn't have to go around. Generations, they will defend it. And he just also immortalized somewhere else. So he doesn't have to pay nothing to maintain the life. We will maintain it for him. So in essence, we're opposing our own self. And we don't even know we're doing it. But we're still in gentleness to teach and give what we believe in the situation. Hoping, for example, that God will give them repentance of acknowledging the truth. It's not automatic, folks. You can't just say the truth to somebody believing a lie and they have ears to hear it. Blessed are those that have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. God has to choose to allow them to hear. And whatever reason and condition they are for that, that's His business. But He still decides. But your hope is that he will allow them to acknowledge that that is the truth. If that happens, then they will be able to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil that they've been taken. So, let's just look at this real simply so you understand how it works. Satan's bait is taking something that we want to know about a subject of truth, and then trying to give us the answer of what that is through a minister that doesn't realize he's already believed the lie, and given scriptures and things in a certain way that we're sitting there a reasoning and understanding, we will come to a conclusion that's not the truth. Like I shared it with true and true earlier. And as soon as we believe that's the truth, we didn't bring the thoughts under control, we didn't test it by the Holy Spirit, we release our faith into it, we're in the snare. So that's what God said, that we believe something that we were in disobedience to God because we never should have believed it without testing it. It's not a suggestion from God, it is a commandment from God to bring your thoughts under control in obedience to Christ. So for you to believe that lie, you started with being in rebellion to God, you took over the Lord, so if you're being Lord, you're not obeying what God told you to do to start with. That's how you got in the snare. So it's nobody else's problem but yours. You made the problem. And the only body that's going to get you out is the same one that got you in, and that's you. 
I can't rescue you, but I can bring you the key to your snare. And that key is truth. You shall know the truth, and what? The truth will set you free. So we can bring to the truth to someone, pray that God will give them ears to hear, and if they realize, and all of a sudden they ask God, and the Holy Spirit witnesses to them that that's the truth, and they're convinced that that's the truth, then also the Holy Spirit will convince them that what they had been believing is now a lie. The moment you are convinced that what you had been believing was a lie, you will quit believing the lie. The second you quit believing it, your faith will return back to you. And now the truth that you heard, you're now convinced that is the truth. Now you can release your faith into the truth and immediately you're out of the snap. That is the process. That's what gets you in and that's what gets you out and there's no other way. There is a serious famine in the land of truth. Because it's mostly half truth. It's things that are true. But as soon as things you hear things that are true and they're not true, they're all part of the snare. It is part of bait for whatever snare is going to catch you in. You should never be hearing anything but truth. You're saying? Because it's those true things put in a way, adding something to it or taking something out, bringing you to the conclusion that's ensnaring you. So at least we should approach God without having what we're believing chiseled in granite. I'm not saying quit believing anything you think you know. I'm saying get in the Word of God and examine the Word of God and get before the Holy Spirit and check it honestly without an opinion. Is this truth or not? If you can get at least a simple communication that I teach on just the witness of the Holy Spirit, you should be able to come before God, make sure you're in the Spirit, the opinion's out of the way, bring up something you believe is the truth. It doesn't mean you quit believing, it means you accept the possibility that you could be wrong. At least accept that possibility. And without it being not caring where it's right or wrong, you just want to know the truth, ask the Holy Spirit to witness. Just yes or no, is this the truth or not? If you won't witness to it, then ask God or start studying and let the Holy Spirit help you to show you why it's not the truth. So that you can be convinced it wasn't the truth, and when you are, then quit believing it. And you get out of that snare. So this is a process. Once you learn how to walk in the Spirit, that accelerates. Because your communication starts working better with the Holy Spirit, and you just go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. That's exciting. Old things passing away, and all things becoming new, and you start growing spiritually. And once you taste that and you start seeing the fruit of it, you will acquire a taste for that kind of change. And the more you cooperate with God and understand the system, the easier it is. You know why most people don't like to hear truth? It's because of what they feel like when conviction comes. When you use a word, you're being convicted. What does that sound like to you? You're going to get convicted tonight if you stay here. <laughs> or if you come to that meeting, you're going to get seriously convicted. Well, I've got something I need to do at home. I think I need to bake some bread tonight. Or <laughs> it's not a comfortable feeling for most people. And that's why most preachers don't preach truth that will bring conviction because it makes them uncomfortable. And as I said, they're going down the road with their bill phone. Do you know what conviction feels like to me? Sweet music to my ear. That's what it is. Ah, praise the Lord, here comes another blessing. Amen. Oh man, this is like the angels in heaven are singing. That's me. Think about this. What is conviction? That word in the Greek also means convinced. So with truth, when God's speaking truth to you, He's convincing you that this is the truth, and he's also convincing you that what you were believing was not the truth. He was bringing evidence to convince you of something. So how are you going to, he's going to make sure that you don't ignore that? Then a little alarm goes off. Some people, you got to go to work early, you set an alarm. Do you like the sound of the alarm of the morning? <laughs> but we set them because if it doesn't go off and wake us up, 
and we sleep at noon when we end up losing our job, then all other kind of consequences come into place, right? Yeah. So we endure the alarm clock. When I was growing up, we had an alarm clock called Big Ben. You remember the tower? Yes. That, you remember those yes. typical brass bells on the top of it? That thing was torment. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it would go off and you just smack it over and you kind of turn that thing off. Many years ago, they come out, remember, they come out with clock radios. In Tulsa, we had an FM Christian radio station 24 hours a day. I could set that to music. And when it's time to get up, I wake up to worship and praise. And music's coming. And I wake up smiling. Good morning, Lord. They both did the same thing. They really did. It was time to get up. And one of them, I'm smacking at it. And I smile and say, good morning, Lord. So which way did the alarm sound to you? But that's all conviction is. It's an alarm going off in you to alert you that truth has come. Don't let the enemy steal it from you. Don't lose it. Embrace it and process it. Whatever is exposed, then you can quickly repent, let that go, receive it in its place, and the alarm goes off. If you resist it, the alarm keeps, keeps going. You know what I'm Especially if the alarm's sitting on the other side of the room. You've got to get out of bed to turn it off. <laughs> Some people have to do that, because if not, they'll turn it on and go back to sleep. It's an alarm. That's what I see it as. But what most people do is when the alarm goes off, we resist it in rebellion, puts us in the flesh, Satan gets access, and then he starts bringing condemnation on you. Mm. Then he turns around and judges the person who spoke the word that convicted you that they're putting the condemnation on you. Then you get offended at the preacher. I'm not ignorant of this truth. When I'm going to church, I make it seem a little strange. But when I was being first trained, I go to church, I would pray for the pastor who was going to be preaching. And I'm praying that God would give them enough truth. I want my alarm to go off as many times as it could in the service. Because as soon as it went off, I'm immediately just accepting what it said. Boom, I'm sitting, I'm waiting for the next one to come. Write it down, you know, then I'll process it all when I get home. But I'm going to get as many as I get. more times it went off, the more I was blessed in that service. If it didn't go off, I already didn't get blessed. Because there is no spiritual growth without something passing away and something becoming new. And what's passing away is part of the access that Satan has to you to keep the old Adam nature alive. And what's becoming new is part of what you need to start growing in the spiritual realm and becoming more like Christ. Why is that negative? That's the most positive thing in the world. So we need to understand how the process works. So these snares... We need to learn how to process things in our lives and start rescuing ourselves from this neck. Okay? Okay, I'll stop on that part of that right now. Okay, I'm going to share something now that might seem a little strange to you, but it's important. When we realize <coughs> how much the church has missed it, because we can look at the fruit and see if we missed it a lot. Where should we be evolving for the last 2,000 years? So we've been regressing, not evolving. So something's wrong. You're saying if they started out with the foundation we had to begin with, that we should have been growing and building on that for the last 2,000 years, and the church is not anywhere close to where it began. But as I shared with you yesterday with Paul and Corinthians, the first century hadn't even gone until it was already being corrupted. Satan already had access. He already transformed into an angel of light. He was already deceiving people. The Corinthians were believing lies. False teachers were around. There was always Satan already had his ministers that were Christian ministers that was teaching lies and lying about those is actually bringing the truth. Jesus, when he was here on this earth, ministering, teaching, if you would take all the sermons that Jesus preached while he was here, what do you think would be the predominant subject that he preached on? And there wasn't anything even a close second. What do you think the absolute above everything else on the subject matter that he actually preached about? 
kingdom of God by far than any other subject. I think I've already shared this, but remember I asked God what the number one reason why your children don't know what you want them to know. And he said it's what they think they know is hindering them from knowing what I want them to know. If you look at a lot of denominations, a lot of them have a dispensational chart. You understand what I'm talking about? Periods of time and certain things that happen. And I noticed when I was looking at some of those years ago, it seemed like the things I really liked to have been a part of was either in the dispensation that's already gone or ones that I got here yet. It didn't seem to be where I was at. And that's kind of confusing to me. Remember we were talking about earlier about the John 73, the gift of eternal life? What a high percentage of Christians don't know what that is and we realize how important that is. <clears throat> what is our basic denominational teachings on the kingdom of God? What are the dispensations of God's kingdom? We talk about the kingdom of heaven, the third heaven where the Father is right now, Jesus, where the new Jerusalem is. We're waiting on Jesus Christ to come back. Some don't believe it's going to happen that way. Most do. That he's going to come back and set up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. Do y'all believe that? Yes. Okay. At the end of that thousand years, Satan's going to be loose for a season. The last big war. And then the Father shows up. When the Father shows up in the new Jerusalem, he's going to destroy the heavens and the earth and create all new ones. All judgment, everything is done, and we move into new Jerusalem, into the new eternity, and we rule and reign forever in that kingdom. Is that right? Okay. So by the time Jesus <clears throat> ascended back to his Father, there's an angel there, and he said, Why are you standing here gazing up in the air? And he told him, he said, the same way you see him ascending, you will see him descending. Now, that ascending took place 2,000 years ago. We're waiting on him to descend. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years, we hope it's close. But it's been 2,000 years in between. So why would Jesus, in the short period of time he had to preach, the three years or so, why would he spend by far most of his time preaching about the kingdom of God to those people there that are all dead and have been dead for 2,000 years and we're still waiting on the kingdom to come? So what relevance was it for them? It wasn't coming and it hasn't come for 2,000 years. Does that make any sense? You think you've been talking about salvation. You know, he'd come to save them. Or the love, or whatever else. But there's not anything close. Kingdom of God beyond everything. Almost every time he preached, he was talking about the kingdom of God. I'm going to share it. I'm not trying to mess your doctrines up. Okay. Well, I might, but. I'm not going to promise. I'm not trying to. But I'm not teaching this as a doctrine. I just want to share some scriptures with you. And. You just meditate on these. There's a few things that Jesus said based on what I think I know does not make any sense. It makes sense to me now, I'm just saying, but what I thought I knew years ago, it didn't make any sense. For example, in John 14, 18, Jesus had already told them in this time of the Last Supper that it was better for them that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comfort of the Holy Ghost is not going to come. Now, do you think that made any sense to their minds? They was with Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And he's going to go away and send something back they can't see, and that's going to be better? How many of you ever thought that you wish Jesus was here in the flesh like he was then, or you'd like to live in that time? You ever thought that? Yes. But if all of a sudden he was here in the flesh, he would not be in New York. He would be in where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So if you want to see Jesus and pat him on the shoulder and hug his neck, then you don't have to get on a plane, you don't have to go to Israel. 
you have any idea when the word gets out around the world that he's in Jerusalem? Yeah. How many people are going to be on planes going that direction? <laughs> Do you have any idea how long that line is going to be and get your chance to shake his hand or hug his neck? You better have a whole lot of vacation time. I tell you that right now. And you better take a tent with you because there's not going to be any hotel rooms available. And if you ever do get to the front of the line, somebody behind you is going to be a hurry and you go, they've been waiting for five days themselves trying to get to the front of the line. And you're going to have a few moments and boom, that's it. And now you're waiting on your next holiday next year to go see him again. But when the Holy Spirit came, you understand technology, you think we're living in state of art, it's archaic compared to the kingdom of God. That's what amazes me, how Christians can believe that God can't come over the phone that will work two ways for us, but we believe the technology that man has done and we also say, I believe the scripture that God's ways are millions of light years above man's. That doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> By the Holy Spirit being in every one of God's children, I know it for a fact. I haven't proved with this many people, but I've proved enough to prove the principle. He could be talking to one million of us at the same time about a different subject, and we all have his undivided attention. Or one billion for us, that's good. You say, well, how in the world can you do that? I don't have any idea, but a lot of those can talk to me, and he can be talking to Keith at the same time, or anybody else in my team at the same time. So I know that technology is there, and I don't have to wait on my time, I don't have to get in the queue like I shared last night, I don't get a busy signal, I can be with him anytime I want to, talk anytime I want to, as long as I want to talk. That is better, but who has accessed that? How many people has made better of that? So he was telling them, it's going to be better than that come. That didn't make any sense to him. Now, we know that he ascended after that, and according to what we think we know, our doctrines, then the kingdom has been waiting for 2,000 years, and we're waiting on Jesus to come back. So all those guys are dead. But in Luke 14, 18, Jesus said, I'm excuse me, John. Give me scripture, John. 14 18. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's pretty plain scripture, isn't it? Yeah. He was talking to the disciples. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now, when I first started walking, I went to people and said, well, Where's the Father at? They explained the Father and Jesus are in the third heaven. The Holy Spirit is here, and we're waiting on Jesus to come back. Is that not right? Yeah. But Jesus already told him the Holy Spirit, he's going to send and pray to the Father and send the Holy Spirit back. But then he said, I will be your comfort, I will come to you. If I'm not mistaken, aren't all those people dead? I think they're dead, aren't they? Yeah. And based on what I think I know, he didn't come back. Mm -hmm. So did Jesus lie? Mm -hmm. No. But then, that don't make sense then. So what do we do with the scripture like that? We ignore it, we go on because we think about it too much, we get in trouble. That's, that's just what we're going to do. Well, in Mark 9, 1, he also said, there's some of you here who will not die until you see the kingdom of God coming in great power. Again, all those people are dead. And we're still waiting on the kingdom of God come in great power. Is that not true? This, this isn't somebody else saying it. This is red letter. You got a red letter edition? This is red letter. Jesus said this. In Luke 17, Jesus was speaking, and as usual, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were getting all bent out of shape. And, uh, they finally got aggravated with him and they didn't ask him a question, they demanded. They demanded that he would tell them when this kingdom is coming that he's talking about all the time. And this is what he said. The kingdom of God is not coming with outward observation. You're not going to say, well, here it is, or there it is. It's going to be in you. Now, you run that through your natural reason, you don't know what sense that makes. <laughs> Nobody's going to see it when it comes. 
and it's going to be in you, and we're waiting on the kingdom to come. When he comes on that white charger and he wipes out an army of several million people, you tell me CNN News and Fox and everybody's not the middle of their filming that? Everybody on this planet is going to be seeing that. <clears throat> so he's, it's not coming with observation. That doesn't make any sense either. And it's going to be in you? How big a kingdom could it be if it fits me? I know I've gained a little weight, but I'm not, that big. <laughs> I'm not even big enough for a kingdom for ants. <laughs> so I'm saying that does not make any sense whatsoever. In the 18th chapter, I think 17th verse, is where he said, And except you come as a little child, you shall no wise enter in to the kingdom of God. Except you come as a little child. So let me ask you this question. Assuming that Jesus did not lie, but based on what I think, I know it appears he did. You understand what I'm saying? But we don't change what we think. Whatever. We still go with that doctrine which makes it look like he lied. Why didn't somebody do a little research on that? Why don't some of the theologians explain to us this? I know how they explain it. This doesn't belong in there. This shouldn't have been put in here. This is a mistake. He didn't really say that. That would be their answer to that. But I don't believe that. I believe he did say it. I believe he meant what he said. And I don't believe he lied. Yeah. So my attitude to word, towards the Word of God, when God says something, that is the fact, that's the truth, where I understand it makes any sense or not. That's right. Right. I agree. If I can't understand, I'm the problem. He's not the problem. Yeah. <clears throat> if I had his sense or understood from his point of view, it would make sense. Mm -hmm. So assuming he did not lie, then is there any event that took place while he, the disciples, his disciples were still alive, that you could say something came in great power. Mm -hmm. It was within them. Mm -hmm. Romans 14, 17 says, The kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It is righteousness. That's right standing with God. Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. That's the description of that. So the spiritual realm, the aspect of the kingdom of God came on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. But Pentecostals don't teach that. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? We don't teach that. The kingdom of God has been here for 2,000 years mm -hmm. in the spiritual realm. You said, you mean Jesus is not going to come back and literally set up his kingdom and we come and glorify God? Yes, yes, yes. But he did not leave us here helpless on the earth with the Satan running rampant for 2,000 years and tell us to keep the earth. How in the world can we keep the earth if, they, if our kingdom is not even here? Where is our, our haven, our place of rest, our safety? We're Christians. We're someplace we can live that we are safe from the devil. We're waiting on the kingdom to come so we can be in that place where the devil has no place. But it's been here for 2,000 years. And it wasn't possible for us to function in that realm until the Holy Spirit came. And it wasn't possible for the Holy Spirit to be in you till Jesus came and paid the price for the curse on the law and His blood qualifies to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We weren't capable of being in the presence of God. But as soon as that happened, what happened? The Spirit of God came in Amen. us. Amen. The kingdom of God came in us. And we can now live in that kingdom. You can't live it from the natural realm. So he gave us a new nature that is not corrupted. It wasn't born in sin. It is uncorrupted. And in that nature, we can live in that spiritual realm and have our being and go about our business. But the natural cannot enter it, nor can Satan or anyone his kingdom enter into that kingdom. Mm -hmm. And in that realm, nobody can say, well, here it is, there it is. It's in us. Mm -hmm. In the Amplified, when you amplify that verse, it says it's in you and around you. Mm -hmm. When I go to places like in Africa, or where I've been around witch doctor, where a lot of cult activities going on. I'm in the spirit. 
I'm walking in the kingdom, so the Holy Spirit is not only in me, but it's around me because I meet that condition. I'm in right standing with God. I have His peace. I have His joy. And I can live there. I can move around. I can have, I go about my business there. So when I do that, I can walk right through the enemy's camp, a thousand demonic spirits there. I don't have to be fighting. I don't have to be rebuking or binding, losing. I have total peace, total joy. No demons can attack me. It's a different world, folks. I've got clear communication. I'm standing there as a soldier, but it doesn't make a difference if I stand there as a baby. You still can't do anything about it. Doesn't need me to be a soldier for Satan to not be able to get access to me. It's where I am. When I was a baby, growing up, he couldn't get access to me either unless he could get me into the flesh. If he caused me to sin, which I would do a lot then, I would get back in the flesh, and yes, he would attack me. So if the devil is attacking you, guess what? You're not in the spirit, you're in the flesh. So instead of standing there in the flesh and trying to attack the devil where you don't have much power, immediately humble yourself and be glory your life. That's what got you in the flesh. And immediately get back in the spirit and the devil has to back off. You should be standing there fighting him all the time. I'll give you an illustration when I was being trained as a soldier. When I was first being trained before I could consistently understand how the kingdom worked, but I wasn't at that point to really fully understand it. I just know who I was. I could hear the Lord's voice, and I was willing to do what He said, and I was learning hardness as a soldier. So, for example, say I was at point A, and God told me to go to point B, that's where my sign's at. So, when I get my order, as a soldier, I made up mind, I'm going to go to B, and I don't care what the devil puts between here and B. I'll overcome whatever he puts. I don't care what. I'm going to be. That's my attitude. And when it gets to be, I'm going to then do whatever God says to do. So I head out with that attitude. And I'm, quote, filled with the Spirit. I'm all prayed up. I'm ready to go. But on the way, the enemy's attacking me. So I'm rebuking it, you know, and I'm splashing out a little Spirit to run them off, keep them off on. So I'm fighting my way from A to B. Hearing spiritual warfare is going on while I'm getting to be. That wasn't my assignment. B's my assignment. When I got to be, I'm about half worn out, and there is a big one standing in the ring waiting on me. Now I've got to climb in the ring with that. That's what I was set to fight. But I'm already wore out. And I have this attitude the only way I can lose is if I quit. So I'm not going to quit to do that to carry me out on the stretcher. So in my mind, that's what I'm going to do. So it's like you go 42 rounds and finally right before I pass out an angel thumps him on the head and he falls over and they hold my hand up, you know. <laughs> and it's kind of hard to tell who's won, you know. So I crawl off back home, lick my wound through while I've got to get back in, in shape. But there's a more excellent way. Now I'm going to show you the difference between that and that's what most people are they function. Even if they're serving God, and that's why most of them won't go into a rough area because the shock of what happens while they're there and getting beat up and everything else, they don't want to go back again. Suppose I had a clear glass up here, and this glass is clean, clear, and it's filled with water. So suppose this glass represented me. And the water represents the Holy Spirit. So I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. You understand the term? Okay. But suppose then that this whole sanctuary was glass all around it. Clear glass all around it. And there was a clear table sitting here in the middle, about halfway up. And I set my glass on the top of that clean glass full of water. And this entire tank is filled with water, the Spirit. From the outside looking in to this huge tank of this water, you don't even see my glass. You just see the water. Now suppose there was a way, and this all around you is the Spirit. Suppose there's a way then at point A, when God tells me to go to point B, Remember like the cloud moving by day and pillar fire? Yeah. Suppose when it's time to go, the tank starts moving towards B. 
and I'm just resting here in the middle of it. And we're having fellowship, communion while we're going to be. I've got peace, I've got joy, I've got communication. And we're, here comes this tank coming down the road. How many demons do you think are going to jump out of the bushes onto that? <coughs> They're going to be heading for the hills. I'll tell you that right now. They're going to be running as fast as they can run. And I learned that I could stay there and get to point B. And if that was my assignment to take out what was in that ring, I did not have to get out of the tank to take it out of the ring. All I need was an order on what to fire or what to say, and he's gone. That I and the tank will go back home and rest or whatever it is. Go the next place. That's the difference between having the spirit in you and you being in the spirit. One of the lies of Satan, he makes that as synonymous. If you got the spirit in you, the scripture says you being in the spirit, they're synonymous, it's the same thing. I'm here to tell you it's not the same thing. One of the popular things that most people believe is when the scripture talks about Christ being in you and you being in Christ, it's the same thing. I'm here to tell you it's not the same thing. When you read the scripture and you find out where all the promises are or where all the good things are, it's the end, you in it, not it in you. If it was automatic, then we'd automatically have all these things, and we don't have them. When you humbled yourself, the Spirit came in us. But for you to be able to live in the Spirit, they are conditions. They was conditions for it to even come in you. That is, humble yourself and repent of sin. But if you want to live in the tank, then you got to have Jesus functional, 100% Lord in your life. Because as soon as you touch the Lordship, you are out of the tank. Your covering exposure is gone. God, by grace, can give someone else a chance to have a little bit of rest. You can actually expand your borders. Years ago, 25 years ago, I was training one of our men, and he was in a ministry where he had dealt with demonic spirits and stuff like that, so he really felt like he was a kind of a hot shot in dealing with this. And we ended up midnight in Oslo, Norway. Train arrived. Found out they'd been locked out of the whole country, every motel, hotel, any place to stay. And everybody's having to stay in the train station, and you couldn't hardly, you couldn't walk through this lane everywhere. Pot being smoked everywhere, you just smelled it strong everywhere. It just felt like you stepped off the train into hell, that's what it felt like. I mean, there's demonic spirits everywhere. This friend of mine, it's just like a swarm of bees was attacking him. So he rebuked these binds, and I've been sharing with him these principles. But in his mind, he's talking about, you know, he had seen demons. He had seen these big boys, you know, and, and in his mind, yeah, that what you're saying sounds not, but he really won't work on these big guys. It's like, you know, I've, I've dealt with a serious thing. But I'm standing there in my total peace, everything's fine, and they're just eating his lunch. <laughs> and he just wanted to get out of there as quick as he get out of there. And the Lord told me to tell him, have him come over and stand beside you. I said, Joey, come over and stand beside me. And the Lord just opened the shield up. He come and stood beside me. I said, now what do you feel? Just absolute peace and joy. No attack of whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I said, Father, what do you want me to do now? Command every unclean spirit to leave this building now. And just, I'm speaking right now, and there's people everywhere I didn't raise my voice. I command every unclean spirit to leave this building now. <laughs> Immediately be gone. He can walk around anywhere, there's no attack. He changed his attitude. <laughs> it's different equipment, folks. It's not the might, it's not the power, it's by my spirit set for it. There's a big difference. So we learn to let go and let God. I'm a soldier. When I was in the U.S. Army, I was an expert with the weapons. If I got an order to go do something, then with that order, it included anything I needed to fulfill the mission that I was given. If I needed 20 guys to go with me, if I needed three trucks, if I needed whatever equipment I needed to get that job done, then it was authorized in that order. When God gives me an order to go wherever around the world, in that order is authorized everything I need to go and successfully do what he sent me. That's not my responsibility, that's his. It wasn't my idea to go, it was his idea to go. Mm -hmm. It is my responsibility to find out what he's authorized, 
to appropriate what he authorized by faith and to use it in a lawful way. It's as simple as that. So you don't go to war of your own expense. That's his responsibility. Everything that I need, do I need intelligence about what the enemy is doing? If I need power, it doesn't make any difference. Whatever I'm going to need on it, he is responsible. I get another order, just like he said, to rebuke the spirits and command them to leave. With that order, I had the authority that when I spoke, their power went up and they were gone. I didn't have to fire up and you know scream out of the top of my voice something. I just had to speak the word. Felt no different than if I just speak it right now. It was no great anointing you know, on me. I just had a peaceful place. It wasn't goosebumps and jumping up and down the floor. Thank God. <laughs> it's just a peaceful rest. Didn't, you know, my motor's out of Didn't even raise it up. Just relax. The angels of God. I'm a soldier. When I go, the angels are assigned me. They're warrior angels assigned me when I go. When God speaks something that needs to be done, they take care of the pivot stuff, you know, <laughs> or the demonic spirit, you understand? They, they going to make sure they follow the instructions. It ain't just left for chance. We're all God's children. You have some serious rights in his kingdom. When you step out of the kingdom and you rebel and you leave home, you give up a lot of rights. I rebelled at 17 years old and left our home, went to Chicago on my own, almost starved to death the next three months. But every night, mom was cooking a nice supper, and I could have my feet on the table, and I'm out there stealing corn in the field and eating corn off the cob every night, trying to keep alive. Mama didn't go anywhere. I did. God never goes anywhere. We leave him. He does not leave us. So if anybody's going to have to move, we did the moving and we have to do the moving to come back. Mm -hmm. He's still where we left him. Yeah. He's in his kingdom and he doesn't leave his kingdom to go chasing us. Mm -hmm. You understand? Now the spirit is everywhere. He can speak to us. That don't mean you're in the kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? He's still with us. Okay, let's look at a couple more scriptures. In Colossians 1.13, don't just a second. Uh, I gave you Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not made or drink, but rise to peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Acts 17, 28. Paul was talking about in Christ again, this end. It's in Christ, this is where I live, he said. This is where I move. This is where I have my very being. That's the same thing. That is synonymous with the kingdom. The number one hindrance to all this is the things we think we know. Just think about this. In Colossians 1.13, the day we got saved, we were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. That's what Colossians 1.13 said. The day you got saved, you were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now how could that happen if the kingdom's not here? Where did we go? The third heaven? How many of you went to the third heaven when you got saved? <laughs> All might have, but I didn't. <laughs> I didn't go into the millennial kingdom. It wasn't here. So how did he translate us into the kingdom of his dear son when we're still waiting on his dear son to come back and establish his kingdom? That spiritual phase, that phase of the kingdom is already here and he is Lord of it now. Yes, another one is coming. Do you think, I'm, if you're not there, I'm going to start meddling and quit preaching, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> because this may mess up your doctrines. But do you honestly think that everybody that names the name of Christ that goes to church? Is going to rule and reign for that thousand years with Christ? No. Have you ever read any scripture that gives some kind of description of who these people are going to be? This is a place of honor. Do you think he's going to allow us to rule and reign on this planet when we would not allow him to rule and reign in our life? How is that being fair? 
when we dishonored him and mocked him, but we're now going to have the authority that everybody has to submit to us. In Revelation 17, I think it's 14, it described those that are coming back to Jesus. They are called and they are faithful. They're called, they're chosen, and they are faithful. That's the one that it says they're coming back. He's coming for a bride, and we know the bride's coming. But the bride is going to be without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. Does that any of that describe normal Christians? It does not. But based on what we think, well, if I don't make that, then I'm totally lost. No, it doesn't. You can't assume that either. Because of what we believe, we put all the eggs in one bag. See, all that's got to be right, or this all got to be wrong. It doesn't have to be either one of them. Because we don't know the truth. God said, I will give honor for honor is due. And that is not giving honor for honor is due if someone has been a prodigal son, child, or a whole life been rebellion to the God and just living off and using and abusing their rights to be able to come back and be in a position of honor. That dishonors the one that were honorable. What can we learn about this kingdom that was actually translated into, this spiritual realm? So that's where we were translated. Remember, when you first got saved and you were translated into the kingdom of darkness, if you honestly repented of your sin, and when the Holy Spirit came in and cleansed you from all unrighteousness, you went from being under guilt and sorrow for what you had done until all that lifted and you had that perfect peace, you had that joy, you felt the presence of the Lord, you were in right standing with God. What does Romans 14, 17 say? That is what the kingdom of God is. You immediately were in the kingdom of God, yet no one told us that. And that's where you're supposed to stay. So what are some of the things we can learn about that kingdom? In Matthew 6, 9 through 15, I'm not going to turn there, we go all know the Lord's Prayer. The disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. So this kingdom we're talking about, the same rules, the same conditions in the spiritual kingdom here now is exactly the same as they are in heaven. It's exactly the same they will be in the millennial kingdom. It's exactly the same they will be in eternity. God does not change. So if we want to function in that kingdom now, guess what? He is Lord. And when we go to heaven, He's going to be Lord. If we rule and reign in the thousand years, He's going to be Lord. If you're going to go into eternity, He's going to be Lord. Anytime His kingdom is functioning, He is Lord. So why are we wrestling with it now and say we want to rule and reign with Him and we want to spend eternity with Him when He's going to be the absolute Lord? So why are we struggling and not trusting Him now? Is that faith? Aren't we saved by faith? Trust in God? So how can I say I'm having faith in God but I don't trust Him to be my Lord? That's kind of shaky ground to me. If I can't trust Him to be my Lord now and to do what He said to do to bless me, how can I trust Him that He's not going to let me go to hell and save me? Are you going to let the devil undermine your faith? Misdirect your faith? Are we going to sit here and mock him and think we've got him in some legal contract loophole that he can't get out of? Folks, I assure you, he's got fine friends you've never read. <laughs> Nobody's going to put him in a corner and think they've cornered him and get by with anything. He will balance the books. One day the grace will run out. And at that point it's too late to change it. Now we still have an opportunity to do something about it. In Matthew 7, 21. In 
in Matthew 7, starting in verse 21, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity. He didn't say they had not cast out devils. He didn't say they had not done all these wonderful works. He said, I never knew you. You never did the will of my Father who is in heaven. Two things. You have to do His will, and you need to know Him. So He gave us the gift to be able to know Him. He gave us the Spirit so we could know what the will is, and He told us to obey the Spirit and yield to His Lordship so we can do the Father's will. That's a hard scripture. I'm not going beyond that and saying what the consequence of that is. I'm just saying that's pretty sobering. Because that flies in contrast with what a lot of other people believe. Again, Jesus said this. What are you going to do? But guess who's going to be the judge? It's going to be him. So are we going to stand before the throne and say, well, Jesus, I realize you said that, but you must have been lying, but you're not going to do that. Because your doctrine says, our doctrine says, you have to do this. I'm sorry you're a liar, but you don't have to change your judgment. I don't think that's going to work. Let's look in John chapter 5. <clears throat> now, this is interesting to me because the number one reason that Satan will get most people as an excuse of why they have trouble with acknowledging God in all their ways. We don't have trouble reading the scripture with all their ways until it comes down to actually doing it in all your ways. So we start talking about the little things of all your ways, then we bristle up to that. And, and I've shared with the pastor, no matter what country I go to in the world, especially first world countries, the number one excuse everybody comes up with is, well, God gave me a brain, he expects me to use it. That's the first thing I always hear. Now that's making the assumption that if you're acknowledging God in even the little things, you're no longer going to use your brain. That's the false assumption. But remember, the natural cannot understand the things of the Spirit. We talked about 1 Corinthians 2 earlier. So from your natural mind, that doesn't make any sense. But in the spiritual realm, if we are acknowledging God in all our ways, our brain is going to be used far beyond any capacity we ever dreamed it could be used of. You don't have all the answers on everything. How many of you ever sat down to your computer and you needed some more information on something so you Google something? What are you Googling? You're Googling somebody that knows more about that subject than you do. Why are you Googling? you got to brain use it. <laughs> Don't you go learn everything else. Why are you using the Google if you're so smart? <laughs> we realize we don't know everything. Well, I Google God. I don't Google the internet, they got limited information. God knows everything about everything. He knows my future, he's got everything in store, he knows every plan the enemy has against me, he knows every crap that's out there. He will make me look a whole lot smarter than I look, and I don't make it around and push buttons or anything. All I gotta do is just ask him. It doesn't mean that I don't use my brain, I can look at something and, and it picks up the information that is there, and we come to a conclusion in the natural that might make sense based on what we know. But here's the simplicity of that is. I don't assume that that's all the information there is on that. That's pretty naive to think you know everything in the universe there is to know about that. You know you don't. So common sense says that if I can ask him, is this the best plan? When he knows everything about everything, why wouldn't I do that? Why is that not smart? So he keeps me falling in the dizzy. He keeps me getting ripped off of something. He keeps me buying the wrong stock. He keeps me doing whatever. 
He already knows it. He knows if that stock's going to crash or not. He knows if it's going to go up or not. And it's not insider trading because he doesn't work for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's smart. But I don't like to Google him because I don't ever unplug from him. You're talking about your communication. When I turn my computer on, I don't turn it up because I don't ever turn it off. Maybe that's not smart, but I don't turn my mouth. It's on 24 hours a day. Anytime I'm walking around, this, we put the mouse and there it is. I don't have to wait for it to start up. Well, I'm connected by modem to the Lord and the Father. And I don't hang up. When I get through talking, I don't go, amen, and hang up. The line's still open. When I go to bed at night, the last thing I say is, good night, Lord. First thing I say when I wake up in the morning is, good morning, Lord. And he's still waiting. Mm -hmm. He's still on the line. He didn't say, wait a minute, I got somebody else calling him. No. <laughs> Private line. Nobody else on. God says, if you won't trust me in the little things, then I won't trust you with the big things. Do you know why he's those little things? Because that's how he's going to let you prove the equipment and test the equipment and learn how to use it. So in the early stages when you're going to make a lot of mistakes, the cost of mistakes are very minimal. If I was praying about what clothes I should have, what difference does it matter if I got a blue shirt or red shirt? He could care less. It just mattered where he gave me his chance to practice if I could hear it. And if I'm up here wearing this shirt, I should have had an orange one on, then I missed it. In case you're wondering, yes, I did ask the Lord. This is a shirt he told me. Okay. I was thinking that, and so you understand. I practice what I preach. And I've been serving God for 40 some years at a pretty high house, so why would I still do that? Because if I'm not doing that, then that means I gotta go back to my own reasoning and understanding and decide something. He doesn't care what shirt I wear, but he knows what I like best. Or he knows what I'm like in something, or he knows if something's going on that I don't know about. You understand that I may run on that, I didn't realize they would be there and I wasn't appropriately dressed or whatever. He knows all that, but the main thing is it keeps my equipment working all the time on these little small things so that when the big one sneaks in all of a sudden during the day, my equipment's already running, bam, it just immediately goes to the big thing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to shut the other one down and go back and start this one up. That's the main reason. And to practice, because the same principles of why I would miss him on what shirt to wear is the same when I miss him on what car to buy, or what job to take, or what house to buy. It's the same principles. So it's a time to practice the things in the book, the fundamentals of how to walk with God, and how to stay in the Spirit. And it gives you a chance to be able to acknowledge Him, and get comfortable with Him directing your steps, and start realizing, wow, I'm doing something that don't mean nothing, but the God of this universe is talking to me. Yeah, I believe it. You know, he's that friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's here with me. Here. Here's an, I'm talking about the scheme of things. What, he could care less what you're wearing and what you do. That isn't the issue. The reason you did that, and I'm not sure some of you understand it, I believe, and some of you make the same statement, well, God, you know, Things are big that we can't handle, we go to those with God. But the little things, he's busy. He's running the universe, we need to take care of those. That's the way I grew up. And we're assuming he's not capable of having the universe, the big things, and the little things. Because we underestimate what his technology is. But I believe that to start with. So when I had some big problems, I would go to the Lord, come to his presence, and I thought that I had a reason to be there. You understand what I'm saying? And now I'm asking about this, I get my answer, and it's kind of like, well, I've excused myself, but there's probably a lot more waiting to talk to him, and he's busy, so I would leave. And I believed that, and it took me right out of his presence, right out of the Spirit. And I'm having to wait till something else fell apart, and I'm going to run before I can come back again. So I did that one day, and I kind of negotiated, I said, Lord, things in this other level here, can I ask you questions about those? And the Spirit witnessed to me. And I had a half a dozen or more of those so I could stay longer. That's my motivation, just to stay and talk to him. And so he did that, and so I kept saying, can I ask you things at this level? And I kept negotiating that. And that's how I got down to the close. Okay, the very similar, can I ask you about these things? And the Spirit witnessed to me. 
And that's why, because I didn't want to leave this prison, I didn't want to, quote, hang the phone up. I wanted to keep talking, but I didn't understand all the other things. Plus, I knew I had an indwelled habit of leaning them all understanding that I would direct things myself without even thinking. So I needed to be able to habitually do something to do it. To form the habit, if you habitually do something about three weeks in a row, it'll move from your conscious to your subconscious, and you can do it without thinking. Well, I've been Lord of my life for my entire life, and so I automatically make a decision without even thinking about it. So even when I decided to acknowledge God, first thing you know, I'm not doing it at home, I'm concentrating on it, then I go to work, first thing you know, it's quitting time, and I haven't asked him another thing. So it just went in this automatic. So I realized I had to do two things. I had to break the old habit, but at the same time establish the new habit. Well, to do that, then I need to consistently be acknowledging him and talking to him, because as long as I'm acknowledging him and he's directing, I can't be leading him on understanding and directing myself. So instead of trying not to go the wrong way, I focused on going the right way. Galatians 5, 16, Paul said, I learned that if I just walk in the Spirit, I cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. If walking in the spirit is going north, then walking in the flesh is going south. You can't go north and south at the same time. Most people are looking south, which is like going in the flesh, and they're trying not to go that way, trying to hold the brakes, but they keep being tempted and go that way. Repent is turn the car around. And I started heading the right direction in the spirit. It doesn't matter if you're only going one half a mile an hour. As long as you're going north, you can't be going south. Right. You understand? Mm -hmm. So as long as I'm acknowledging God in every little thing, I'm still going this way. Even though there don't no amount to anything, it's keeping me busy. But the first thing you know then, as I'm developing the habit of acknowledging Him, I'm now losing the habit of leaning to my own understanding. See, before for me to acknowledge God, I had to stop and concentrate and think to do it. For me to direct my own step, I didn't have to think at all. I just automatically would do it. But as this started changing over, then I had to stop and think to direct it myself. It slows it down enough to give me a chance to catch it and stop it before I've actually done it. Where with the other one, I don't have to think, I automatically do it. Now, this is a big difference. I shared some of this I did this morning or last night. Because of that, if something happened all of a sudden threatening to us, most people from the natural, you will go into what we call the fight or flight syndrome. Okay? You either want to fight against whatever the threat is or you're going to run from it. That's natural. And while you're trying to decide which one of those you're going to do, I've already asked the Lord what He wanted me to do and I'm already acting on what He told me before you decide which one of those two you're going to do. And I didn't have to think to do it, I just automatically would do it. And because I'm not this unconnected, I'm still connected. Even when things start to happen, I don't have to ask. He just starts bringing the information. It just starts downloading. And I'll tell you something that may sound strange to you. Because I've done this. In real time, when we would see something happen in a very quick period of time, I've had God speak to me, and I've never, in life and death situation even, have ever felt the Spirit of God rushed in trying to get me to do something. It's always laid back, maybe it's firm, but very steady, as if it's all the time in the world. That technology is not available in the earth. It's not developed. I've been threatened, I was in Africa once, and it's a lunatic. He got about seven foot tall, a big Afro, and he's a lunatic, all shredded clothes. And there were about 10,000 people there looking out the ocean these days. Wooden boats were coming and fishing boats coming, so it's a real spectacle. There's about 10,000 people there. And I was going to do a conference with pastors that evening in this village. And a couple of them had took me and my Nigerian coordinator down to see the spectacle of these boats coming in. And then about 10,000 people jammed all the way down to the sea. And I go down the road, ended dead ended there, and there's a wall up about this high, just you know, country block wide. And it was down maybe 15, 20 feet behind it, down to an area there. And I couldn't see the boat stuff, so I was standing up on that wall trying to get a picture of the boats coming in over the heads of all these 10,000 people. 
Then I hear this blood curling scream. Now, my coordinator was not yours, but we was in Ghana. And the two Ghana pastors was with me there. And I heard this blood curling scream, and I turn around, and here this huge guy standing. He was just going berserk looking at me. And I mean, I said, Lord, what's the problem? He said, he's offended because you're taking pictures. And I said, what do you want me to do? He said, put your camera back in the case and gesture like, I'm sorry. Well, I did that. And as soon as I did that, I mean, he let out a rage. And he was, he was maybe about twice as far here to him building from me. And this big guy, and he took y'all front of me wide open towards me, screaming. I mean, just wild screaming, coming at me. I'm standing up on this little wall with this straight off 15, 20 feet behind me. Now, the first thing anybody in the right mind would do is get off that wall. Because mm -hmm. he's going to knock you right off the wall. But without him, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, Stand still where you are. And this guy's coming in. So he starts talking to me and telling me what to do. And God is speaking to me about like I'm speaking now as if we had it all day long. <laughs> and I assure you, it was probably maximum three or four seconds from the time this guy left that he was at me. And God spoke to me at a time in normal talk about now do it would take at least 20 or 30 seconds <clears throat> while this guy is coming. And he told me to just stand there. And I just stood there on the wall. And this guy walked up. He was still taller than me, and I'm up on this wall. I mean, God. And he just spit in there. And I mean, he was, he was just going, I had no idea what he said. So I turned around to ask these two local preachers what he was saying. And there's already a half a block away running just hard. <laughs> I asked O.C., the Nigerian, I said, what's this guy saying? He said, I don't know guy what to say. He's crazy, you know. So I'm standing, this guy just jumped down, going all foaming around, and I looked over my right, and there's this sea of about 10,000 people, as I'd say it's 50 yards across, at least, and just jammed up, as far as you can do, way down to the ocean. And on this side, there was a witch doctor standing there with his task the whole deal on, and there's a woman in front of him he was doing his thing with. And I'm standing there, and this guy just raving right in front of me, and the Lord says, walk over and stand by the witch doctor. So the Lord said, so I just stepped off right by this guy, and he starts walking, and I walk over, and if this is the witch doctor here, <coughs> this person, I walk over this close to him, right beside him, and there's this woman there, and he's here doing his thing with her. And I'm standing here, and this guy backed off, and he scared death the witch doctor, the witch doctor killed him. So this guy back door, he's still ranting and raving, but he stayed back there. He wouldn't follow me because he's afraid of the wish dog. Then that funny the Lord had me go stand with this wish dog. So I stood there for a moment. And the guy was still back there, and the Lord said, pass through the crowd and go up around the block to the car. Hmm. Well, this is 50 yards across, just jam-packed. I mean up just as tight as you could get. And like the crowd's looking that way, and I'm here. <laughs> And I got across 50 yards of the path. So I walk up to start to separate the shoulder, and there's at least 10,000 on there, and he's not exactly as I'm inconspicuous. They can tell I want to <laughs> Not like I'm going to sneak through here. You know? <laughs> so I walk up and I start to say, Excuse me, to try to pull them apart, but they're so tight you couldn't even move. And as I started walking up, not one person turned and looked at me. But it just opened up, about like this. And I walked through, and O.C., the guy's a witness, he followed behind me. Nobody turned the face. When I was by the witch doctor, he never looked at me. The woman sitting right there, she certainly could see me. She never once turned her eye to me. I walked completely through that crowd, never touched one person. Nobody looked at me, said anything. Out the other side, went up around the block, got there, and these two preachers sat in the front seat. <laughs> and my Nigerian guy said, Matt, he wanted to wring your neck. Because their society, they're responsible for protecting and taking care of you. And he's really going to get off. I said, oh, see, you leave him off. I don't need them to protect me. The Lord take care of me. You don't say anything. So we just got in the back seat. They started up, went on, never said a thing about anything. <laughs> the rest of the day, I didn't beat him in that. So I'm just saying that communication, to be able to trust God, <coughs> Because if I'd have panicked, it'd have took me out of the spirit. And all those demonic spirits, I'd have been in some serious conditions around there. You can't wait to be there and start learning something like that. You understand? So you're not going to put everybody there. I'm just saying 
that was probably 27 years ago, 28 years ago, a long time ago. But just little things like that, you experience and there's no making any sense to the natural mind whatsoever. It's just something, it's well, no big deal. It's just something that God does. It won't understand the simplicity of that. Okay, it's so okay. John 5.30. We say that, uh, well, I'm not going to acknowledge God in all things because He gave me a brain and He expects me to use it. <clears throat> so we become more and we direct in those areas. Do you think maybe when Jesus was here, who was not born with an atom nature, he had never sinned one time in his entire life. He's the Son of God. Do you think maybe he was smart enough to direct his own steps? After all, he's the Lord. Do you think he would direct his own steps? Let's think what he said in John 5, 30. Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. That's pretty serious, isn't it? I can of my own self do nothing. But as the voice comes to me, as the Father speaks, so he makes a judge. He doesn't even seek or consult his own will. Now, if Jesus, who was perfect, had that kind of respect to the Father, and the Father now has put, after he paid the price, the down the road, has put everything in heaven and earth under him. You think he doesn't deserve the same respect he gave the Father? You think the Father is not going to demand that we give him the same respect that his son gave him? Mm -hmm. Got news for you, folks. Mm -hmm. If he required that of his son, mm -hmm. he's certainly going to require that for the rest of the children. But we obviously are not as qualified to do it on our own as he was. Mm -hmm. If anyone should have been qualified and be able to direct their own step, it should have been him. Mm -hmm. But he understood why he was there. He understood the order of things. Mm -hmm. And look who he is. Look what position the Father's put him in. He's trying to do the same thing with us. He's trying to make us rulers over the universe, folks. He's not trying to take something away from us. But if you cannot learn to be under authority, you're not fit to be in authority. Amen. Amen. If you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. This is a testament. And Satan plays games with that. And he's doing more damage because of that lordship issue. And the reason he wants us to stay being lord is that keeps us in the natural realm where Satan has access and whatever we would be enjoying of our inheritance in the spiritual realm, he is stolen from us. And if you're in the natural realm, you're not doing any qualifying whatsoever for eternity. All that time is being wasted and stolen, because if you had been in the spirit the same amount of time, then everything you had been doing would have had eternal consequences and eternal value. So whatever that is never happened, because he stole it from you before you ever got it. So we have no idea what would waste it. We read about Esau that sold his inheritance for a bowl of porridge. And we looked at that thing, how stupid that was. And later, when he had realized what he had done, he wanted it back, he could find no place of repentance. I guarantee you what we're selling our heritage for that's worth a whole lot more than he was heir to. We're selling for less than a bowl of porridge. We have no idea of what we're giving up, just some little simple pleasure of the flesh. Mm -hmm. If you could see the price tag on it in numerical terms, it would shock you so bad, you wouldn't think about ever making a decision again on your own. Right? Just out of absolute number of selfish motivation, you wouldn't bring it. A couple more things about the kingdom of God, Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Mm -hmm. Then he was talking about material things, then all the things we've added unto you. So he's speaking to them now. So how could they go about be seeking the kingdom of God first if it wasn't coming for 2,000 years? 
If, why do we give an instruction like that? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I like this and in Matthew 11, 11, Jesus had said about John the Baptist, of all the prophets, there was none greater than John the Baptist. Right. But he said, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist, and he said there was no prophet greater than John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between the old covenant and being in the new covenant in the kingdom. You realize that dramatic difference just positionally where you are? Not how mature you are, not how gifted you are, just being there. You're the absolute least one. You're a higher level than John the Baptist was functioning under the law in the natural. So what is the devil stealing from us? What is that qualifying? Matthew 18, 1 through 4, I'm not going to turn there. But those that are humble, like little children, in the kingdom of God, the ones that are the most humble are the greatest in the kingdom of God. In our society, the most humble is the one gets walked over. Mm -hmm. You really don't want to get ahead of it, you've got to take hope. But in God's kingdom, it's just the opposite. The most humble will be the greatest in his kingdom. But humble is not just being a carpet and everybody walks over the top of it. It's recognizing his rightful place in your life and you give honor where honor is due and you bow the knee to him. If you do that, he makes you a vessel of honor and he anoints you and he blesses you. Amen? Yeah. Was Jesus humble? Oh, absolutely. If you're not in humility, you're either in humility or you're in pride. If you're in pride, you sin. The Bible says Jesus never sinned, which means he was never out of humility. Is that right? Yeah. What about when he went to the temple and he saw all the money changers there and he went over and he planted the whip he went and turned all their tables off and run them out of the temple with a whip. Can you imagine somebody standing there and saying, wow, what a humble man. <laughs> <laughs> he was. He was doing exactly what the Father told him to do. He didn't just lose his temper that day. He did exactly what the Father told him to do. And that's humility. So we're just going out and whopping out an army or something else. He's doing what the Father said. He's doing that in humility. When he comes back and he establishes his kingdom and overwhelms this earth, he is still being humility. He's doing exactly what the Father told him to do. So when you walk in the kingdom of God and you walk in humility, recognizing Jesus absolutely is Lord of your life, then what are you doing in obedience to him with the right motive and attitude? You are humble with this walking in being gracious to someone, or a miss a soldier or something, destroying someone to death. It's the same thing. And finally on that, Matthew 23, 13, he's talking about the Pharisees being hypocrites. He said, you shut up the kingdom of heaven, you don't enter in, nor do you allow anyone else to enter in. We have all over this world, pulpits filled with those same hypocrites. They don't enter into the kingdom, nor do they allow anyone else to enter in. They give them some way that seems right. They don't even preach on the kingdom. They don't know anything about the kingdom. And they don't even know that they don't know. Because of the doctrines that we believe that were not from God, that's kept us ignorant, that put us all in snares and robbed us from the truths we should have known. The body of Christ for the last 2,000 years should have not only been living in the kingdom, we should have been developing that until it was such a way of life and such clear teachings on the fundamentals of it that every new group that come along and everybody else around did an example would be the easiest thing in the world for new converts to walk immediately get in the spirit and stay in the spirit. That's sad, that's where it's at. Now we could either, as they say, we could just curse the darkness of that or we can light a candle. As Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. I made up my mind, Jesus Christ is my Lord. I don't care if I'm the only one on the planet that's going to bow the knee. He'll have one here that bow the knee. And I don't need anybody else's encouragement to do it. I do it because I love him. It's the right thing to do. I don't care whether anybody else understands it. I don't care whether they like it or not. It's a decision I made. I've got a free will and I chose to yield it to him. For him to be Lord of my life, I completely trust him with everything. Amen. And I've proven it through the years. 
And I still have a free will, folks. Every day I've got a choice. I can take over the Lordship again and say, okay, you've had it for 47 years, I won't take it back for a while. It would never enter my mind. I would do it even if he said I could. Mm -hmm. The last thing in the world I want to do. So if I spent nearly 30 years of my life being absolute Lord of my life, and spent 40 some years with him being absolute Lord of my life, that's a pretty good test pattern. Mm -hmm. I've experienced it both. Because I've never halfway done it. He's totally Lord or he's totally Lord. I've never been halfway in between. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good test. Mm -hmm. And every day I can choose which way to go back. You could not pay me enough money to go back the other way. You couldn't even threaten me. <laughs> okay, we'll stop there. I don't know where you completely out. <laughs>